some praise tonight. Somebody praise him. For if it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we have been by now? Many times, many a times we take things for granted because they don't happen to us. We don't see the protection of God over our lives. But we are here all because of him. And to now we are grateful. Amen. I want to thank God for all of you. Thank God for your senior pastor, the general overseer. Reverend Faith Odonko, thank you very much. God bless you for your great and outstanding leadership and for the great work you and your beloved wife are doing in this place. It's evidence that God is in this house. When you walk here, there is a presence. There is a presence. There is a presence that, that is in this place that is so amazing. In fact, you can't go wrong in this place. And I'm grateful for your life and all the great work that God is doing with you. Bishop, God bless you. Let's appreciate him one more time. Amen. Thank you. Reverend Yuma, thank you very much for being such a big brother. Reverend Yuma will call me and check up on me and, and text me and and, and will have conversations with me and make sure I'm okay and I appreciate your friendship and I appreciate all the things you do. Thank you so very much. God bless you. Amen. See, the, the, the older you get, the fewer your friends. How many of you know that? The, the older you get in life, the fewer your friends. And so, 
if you have people who are constantly standing with you regardless of their situation and they are still there with you, you have to cherish them and hold on to them. It doesn't matter what happens. Even if they are killing you, you hold on to them because God strategically positions some people in our lives. We don't have to let them go. And uncle, you are one of them. Thank you very much. God bless you. Amen. <laughs> Reverend Chrissy, this thing, God bless you. And my beloved brother, God bless you. And to all the great pastors and all the men of God in the house and your beloved wives, God bless you so very much. I appreciate you for making me a part of this great, great, great conference, Abundant Life Conference 2018. I don't take it for granted to be here. Amen. I'm grateful to God for all of you and for those of you that are working behind the scenes and making things possible in this place. We want to say thank you. Thank you very much. And my very good friend, Daniela J. I know you are somewhere there. Thank you very much. God bless you and your beloved wife. Amen. Uh, I don't know what will happen tonight, but it will happen. I said it will do what? Turn to someone and say it will happen. Amen. I got in yesterday and... Um, Took a little rest today, and I'm glad for what God is doing. And I appreciate all of you. Thank you for my son. And son, God bless you. And my daughter, Rosemont, God bless you. Amen. And uh, you see, tonight I also want to salute my father over there in the States who has been such a strong pillar in my life. He speaks into my life. He directs me, and he, he makes sure I'm okay. And Reverend Dr. Frank of Uswapia, wherever you are, I salute the grace of God upon your life. Let's appreciate him. Amen. And um, I also bring you greetings from Kingdom Praise Ministries. They send their greetings and they are, they are praying with us and standing with us. And I salute all of you out there. God bless you. And now, I want to love my wife a little. Amen. I said I want to love my wife a little bit. Am I allowed? That she, she's a blessing. She came into my life and turned things around. She speaks profound wisdom. She makes sure I am I'm whole and complete. She, she makes sure that I am me and nobody else. She tells, she tells me, it doesn't matter what you see outside and what happens around you, Prince. He would tell me a million times in a day, you are a good man. And she builds that confidence in me. And Kiki, wherever you are, I know you are watching. Thank you for being such a loving wife. I appreciate you so very much. Keep up with the good work. Amen and amen. Whew, what an atmosphere. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter number one. Verses one to six. And we will read Psalm 119 verse 33. Matthew chapter one. Verse 1 to 6. Tonight I'm speaking on the subject coming out of disorder. Coming out of disorder. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob. And Jacob begat Judah and his brothers. And Judah begat Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begat Hebron, and Hebron begat Ram. Ram begat Abinadad, and Abinadad begat Nashon. And Nashon begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begat Obed by Ruth. Obed begat Jezebel. And Jesse begat David the king, 
and and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. And the king begat Solomon by her, who had been the wife of Uriah. Psalm 119, verse 133. 133. Psalm 119, verse 133. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Order my steps in thy word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. Shall we pray? we are grateful king of glory we bless your name for such an opportunity to be in your presence for Bible says that for unto you alone shall the gathering of the people be we have come O oh God in this conference to receive of you we ask in the name of Jesus Christ the son of the living God that my Lord and my God you will speak unto us let the entrance of your word bring forth light and understanding Tonight, none of me and all of you. Let the weak be made strong tonight and let the poor be made rich and let our prayers be released from oppression and let salvation come to the prisoner and open all the gates of prison and set us free and, and to now bring us out of things that are not of you and introduce us to where we belong. Tonight, again, Spirit of God, I pray for accuracy, accurate prophetic delivery power. I pray for your sensitivity. I pray for your promptness and your leadings. I pray your spirit to hover over us again. Oh, you who began the good thing since Wednesday night, you will finish it because you are able to do it. We thank you and we bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Coming out of this order. David said, order my steps in thy word and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. The word iniquity means generational disorder. So David is saying that order my steps so that generational disorder will not rule me. Tonight may God impact us with the order of the kingdom. I said, may God impact us with the order of the kingdom. Yeah. One of the major problems we have in church today is the problem of disorder. One of the major crises we are dealing with in our nation is the crisis of disorder. Where everybody does what they want to do and how they want to do it. And nobody wants to obey structure and systems and, and everybody believes that. They can just wake up and do everything they want to do. And so this order has invaded our system and the system that is supposed to rule us has been collapsed because of this order. And you must understand that God cannot bless this order. It is impossible for God to bless this order. For the Bible says, oh Lord God, how excellent is your name. And so our God is a God of excellence, so he operates in an atmosphere of excellence. Where there is excellence, there is God. Where there is disorder and anarchy, God is not there. And so you cannot function in the area of your life where there is disorder and you will expect that God will bless you. When you live your life in disorder, ladies and gentlemen, you don't see the manifestations of God's blessings because God doesn't operate in the atmosphere of disorder. Amen. Now, by nature, 
Everything on earth gravitate towards disorder. Any house built and unattended to, or any house left unattended to, will gradually gravitate towards what? Disorder. You see this beautiful edifice here? Let's not pay attention to it. And gradually it will gravitate towards what? Disorder. Buy a beautiful car and don't services every three months, and it will gradually gravitate towards disorder. Any instrument left to itself will gravitate towards this other. Leave this keyboard unattended. Don't take care of it. Don't clean it. And eventually, it will break down. Right? Any human body left to itself without proper care will gravitate towards this other. If you like, wake up in the morning for three days and don't brush your teeth. And there will be sweet perfume. And that will be absolute disorder. And so anytime you see order in the physical realm, force is being applied. Anytime you see order in the physical realm, ladies and gentlemen, force is being applied. And so we must understand that order does not just happen. It comes as a result of the applications of force. And so anytime we see this order, it means that the system runs itself and inevitably it produces chaos and it produces confusion. Order is what God is calling us to tonight. Bible said in the book of Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning was the, were the first day. And so we see God creating the universe. And whilst God was creating, the Bible said, there was darkness that began to hover over the face of the earth. That is disorder. The earth was without form and void. That was not God's original intention. And so when God began to realize that the earth was experiencing disorder, right from that moment, he called order into existence. And God said, I don't operate in this atmosphere of this other, and this is not what I intend the earth to be. And so once the earth began to gravitate towards this other, God had the audacity and the power and the authority, and he said, let there be, let there be other. And the Bible said there was light. And so, which means that anytime we see chaos and disorder, there is within it the ability to bring other back. Anytime we see chaos and disorder, it doesn't matter what it is. Within that chaos, there is the seed of order. If only we can identify it. Amen. In the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, in the earth, there is the seed of life. And God created the earth with, with his word, but formed the garden and put man and Eve, Adam and Eve inside. When Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden, they did not have children. They misbehaved, and like we all know the story, and so the Bible said, they were driven out of the garden. And so they went outside the garden, and then they had Cain and Abel, right? And we all know the story how, excuse me, Cain stood up against Abel and killed him. And I'm wondering, you guys are the only guys on earth. Why would you want to kill your brother? Cain killed Abel because they were born in the place of disorder. When they were driven from the garden where God dwelt with them and the presence of God was there, there was order until they were driven. And so when they were born in the place of disorder and anarchy, everything in that place rose up against them and Cain could not handle it. When you live in disorder, things die. When you move from your place of assignment, disorder can find you and life can be difficult. 
For many of us, God has placed us in order, in the place where our assignment will locate us. But for some reason, we refuse to stay in that place and we move and gravitate towards this order. And because of that, many of our visions and dreams and our purposes in life has been aborted because when you live in the place of this order, anything can find you. Order my steps in your word. So that generational disorder will not find me. So tonight you must learn to produce order in your life. Now look at a home where there's order. Or where there's no order. In a house where there's no order, where children sleep anytime they want. And they eat anytime they want to eat. And they can open the fridge anytime they want to open it. Just look at the life of those children. They go to school in the morning very cranky. They become obese, very early stage. Because there's no structure and there's no order in the home. Now, when you go to a church and there's no order and everybody wants to see whatever they want to see, regardless of the instructions of the ushers, you will know what happens. When people become so arrogant until those who have the mandate to speak wisdom refuse to speak, and arrogance begins to dominate, there is total anarchy and God retreats himself. Are you hearing me? When people talk anyhow and those who have the power to correct them keep quiet. Foolish talk becomes the norm of the day. Because when somebody begins to speak nonsense and, and somebody had the power to shut them down, nobody will copy that. But when it becomes normal, it becomes disorder and then it moves and it takes seed and becomes the norm of the day. And God said, I don't operate in an atmosphere of disorder. If you are born in the place of disorder, your life becomes disorder. Now, some people drink, ladies and gentlemen, not because they want to drink, but they were born into drunkenness. They were born to the home of alcoholics. So he saw his uncles drinking, his father drinking, siblings are drinking, so for him, drinking is normal. Somebody born to the home of poverty, they grow up struggling and they live in poverty. And one of the most dangerous things about poverty is when you live in poverty and you don't realize that you are poor. Because sometimes people can live in poverty until poverty becomes normal to them. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? Oh yes, for some of us, until God showed us a little light, where we were was okay for us until we saw the other side of, the li of life. And then we told ourselves that this thing is not good. But before then, you were eating anything, it was okay. You were drinking anything, it was okay. Have you taken a picture of yours? Have you looked at yourself recently, the last picture you took about 20 years ago? When, 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 when you felt you were the, the ogre because you had some green pants, yellow shirt, pink tie, and some red socks. And, and, and you said, we should leave you alone because you, you, you were the champion of the area. Around that time, it was okay. But 10 years after, now you look at yourself and you look at that picture, you will ask yourself, what was I thinking? Was I okay? Because you have moved from this order into the place of order. Tonight, I came to pull you by divine mandate and introduce you to the place of order. Am I talking to somebody here? Some of you, you used to eat some things and it was okay. You wake up in the morning by 10 a.m., you, you are eating kenke. With some heavy, heavy pepper. By 11, you are sweating profusely. You go to work, you are sleeping. I mean, nothing works. And it was okay for you until recently somebody offered you a cup of tea in bed. And gave you some nice breakfast in bed. And you, and you ate it and you enjoyed it and you asked yourself, So, Asuma and again, Jamie, yo. You... You didn't know until there was something for you to compare with. Am I talking to somebody here? Sometimes people live reckless life. And many a times you want to blame them, want to point accusing figures at them. But ladies and gentlemen, that's all they've known their lives. That's all they know. So for them, what you consider abnormal, disorder for them, it is normal for them. And so you don't need to be too judgmental. You don't need to be too hard on them. Give them time. 
and give them space until God will bring them to the other side. Many these days, our churches has become so much of hypocritical church until when people walk in, they don't belong, they don't feel belonging. If anybody walks into our church and we make them feel like they don't belong here, ladies and gentlemen, we are not doing too good. We must allow them to come just as they are. Let the drunkards come. Let the prostitutes come. Let the people who are, who are doing drugs come. When they come and sit, let them sit the way they came. If you cannot handle them in church, then you cannot handle them outside church. But if you can allow them to be in church, when the Spirit of God will come upon them one day, there will be a turnaround. So can we welcome them into church? Amen. For some people, womanizing is okay. That's what they saw their father do. That's everybody does it. So it's okay. That's this, this order has become normal. What role has the church to play in their lives? What do we do to help these people? Sometimes we have to be careful how we treat people. Some people are born into the homes of uh, um, enchanters and diviners. All they know is chanting and pouring libations and, and, and calling on strange gods. And when we see them, we don't want to have anything to do with them. But that's what they are born into. Some people are born into uh, Islamic religion. And when we see them, we feel like, no, 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 that's what they are born into. That's who they are. It's normal for them. Recently, I met a Hindu man, 82-year-old man on a sick bed. And Papa, as I began to minister to this man, he said, sit down, let me talk to you, son. And I sat down, he said, he began to say some deep things and, 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 and some deep wisdom began to come out of this man's mouth. And, and, and all of a sudden, I started looking for my pen and paper to write. And he said, what are you writing? I said, you are speaking wisdom. He said, wisdom is divine. And he said to me, what I'm giving you is divine. But the church has drawn a line between us and them. And we have made them, made them as if they don't belong. So when we see them, we want to walk away from them. But ladies and gentlemen, if we can be a little open, a little accepting, and if we can, we can, we can be a little loving, we will realize that what we condemn is, is not necessarily what God is condemning. And we will realize that there is more in them than we think we know. And so it will give us the opportunity to become better. I'm not talking to somebody here. So we must be careful how we treat people who we think they live the life of this other. But hey, they still carry something. And sometimes we don't blame them too much because that's all they know. Can I come back? And so in Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 9, the Bible said that don't plant two kinds of seed in your field or in your vineyard. If you do, you will forfeit what you have sown, the total production of your vineyard. In other words, if you plant A and B, you are going to confusion. So at the end of the day, there will be total confusion. Don't plant two seeds, meaning that don't, don't live the, in, the, in the life of this order. Do, do, do order in your life. Order is good. If you produce different fruits in your field, you will end up being confused. And you must understand that order is always easier than this order. Order is always what? Easier than this order. All right. Papa, I came to preach. Can there be order in the house? Because you got a little anointing, now we should leave you alone, huh? Because you, you gave one prophecy and it came to pass. Now you are on top. Nobody can control you. You better sit down and allow yourself to be taught and to be brought up. Because you are still a child and a babe in the house. Because you got a little money now. Nobody can see anything to you because you are the biggest tight player. So the senior must bow to you. Order my steps in your word. Order. God is calling us to order. And I said order is easier than what? Okay, I'm here right now. Now, I can call one of my sons in the U.S. And I'll say, Sly, go to my house. When you open the front door, go to the door on your right. 
That's my bedroom. On your left, you see my dresser. Open the dresser. Or you will see maybe three drawers on the left, three on the right. So open the last drawer on the left. You will see maybe seven files, red, blue, green, yellow, and all of them. Pick the yellow one. There is my best certificate in it. Take it and then read to me what is written on it. I am here. If my, my house is in order, Sly will just go into my house, open the door, enter to the left, go to the bedroom. He will see the, uh, the dresser. He will put the last drawer on the left. He will pick up the files. He will see the yellow one. He will pick it up and then he will look inside it and my birth certificate will be there. Why? Because there is what? Order. Have you been in a place where you are looking for your own something and you can't find in your house? <laughs> and sometimes it will take you three days. You will search and search and search and search and you will not find it. And then the day you are not expecting it, you will see it lying somewhere. It's a sign that you are living in disorder. Somebody give God some prayer. And sometimes you needed that thing so very bad that when you didn't find it, it messed up your life. It threw you off. Why? Because you live in the life of disorder. Some of you, if you have to go to your house right now, you have to be jumping over things. Your, your house in, is in total anarchy, total trouble. The day God will come to your house, you have to go back. Some of you, if your pastor says after church, I'm following you to your house, you will pray heaven and earth. Because your, your whole house is what? In a mess. God does not operate in an atmosphere of disorder. In fact, disorder makes life difficult for us. The last time I came to Ghana, I was at the traffic light and the, and the traffic light says red. So I stopped. And there were four people, four cars in front of me, they stopped and I also followed them. And then, I saw one taxi driver from somewhere and then crossed the line and started honking. I said, where are you going? The thing is what? Red. And then as soon as green came up, the first car moved. The taxi driver just went in there, another car in there, another car in there, and I was still standing at the same place. And then red came up again. Green, and then they started coming. So I was like, ah, maybe... Something is wrong with me. <laughs> so me to have started like that. <laughs> and then I have to tell myself, Prince, behave because you don't have to allow their disorderly life. Sometimes we can live in disorder until you become accustomed to disorder. The other day at the traffic light at the airport, beautiful traffic light, and yet I saw policemen directing traffic. So I asked myself, what is the essence? Be because we don't understand red. We don't understand yellow. And we don't understand green. And even with the presence of the uh, law enforcement agencies, I mean, there were agents, there were still chaos. And so we realized that we live in a nation where there's no order. And so a journey that's supposed to take us two hours or maybe 20 minutes takes us an hour. And everybody's frustrated. Everybody's angry. Everybody's insulting. Because order has been taken away from our system. And so David said, order my steps so that generational disorder will not find me. Ladies and gentlemen, what your father did and life became difficult and tough for him is the same thing you are doing. What made you angry with your father? And until today, you still talk about him because you feel he wasn't there for you. He didn't pay your tuition. He didn't give you enough love. You grow up doing the same thing. And we have not sat down to analyze the cause of this thing. And ladies and gentlemen, if you can take a little time and go into it, we will realize that there's a level of disorder that has operated against us. Order my steps in your way. 
so that generational disorder. Hezekiah was about to die. And God said the prophet Elijah. As I, as I said, go tell Hezekiah, put your house in what? Come on, talk to me. In what? Put your house in order. And you will die. Hezekiah puts his house in order and then goes to God and says, God, you can't kill me. And God has to add more years to his life. Order will make you live longer. Order will give you long life. Tonight, if you are living in this order, I break that pattern, I break that joke, I break that system, and I redeem your soul from that thing in the name of Jesus. For some of you, I don't blame you because that is what you were born into it. You grew up in, in it. You have become accustomed in it. And that thing has prevented your ability to become who God says you should be. But tonight, and under the unction of the Holy Spirit, in this conference, every disorder that holds your life must be broken. And may God deliver you and pull you out of this order and bring you to the place of order. Somebody shout, order. I'm not talking to somebody here. Let a wife talk orderly to her husband and her husband will talk orderly. Let her, her husband talk orderly and everything becomes orderly. Why do we allow this order to encroach in our home, stealing our, our joy, our happiness and God is not in that atmosphere. Order my steps. For some of us, we need to take another assessment and ask some questions. So that, how come your life became the way it is? Mom, how come it was the way it was? You need to draw, dig a little deeper and, and ask the right questions from the right people so that you can break some cycles and some systems because we live in an atmosphere where God speaks and where God does things but yet we cannot really align ourselves with the things God is doing because of this order. Can I, can I preach tonight? In the book of Ruth chapter 1 if you can give me verse 1, I'll be happy, please. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem at Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the wife was, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Marlon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. All right. In this story, we see Elimelech, the head of the house, the husband and the father, take his wife and his children and say, let's go to Moab because there was famine here in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem simply means a place of bread. A place where wheat grows. A place where bread is made. Bethlehem. A place where new things are created. A place where the Messiah will come from. Bethlehem. The place where you will experience the power and the presence of God. But yet in Bethlehem there was a famine. The place of bread, hear me somebody, is experiencing famine. The place where wheat grows is experiencing famine. The place where the Messiah is coming from or will come from, that same place is experiencing famine. And so Elimelech said, I can't stand this. And so he picked his wife and two sons and they migrated away from Bethlehem. Hear this. Sometimes temporary, dis temporary disruption of your life doesn't deny that you are still blessed. The fact that your life is temporarily disrupted doesn't mean that you are blessed. The fact that something just happened or went wrong doesn't mean that you are cursed. And let me like there was a temporary disruption of your life, but Bethlehem still remains the place of bread. That 
is why for many of us, we cannot see the glory of God because we cannot handle temporal disruption of life. But whether you like it or not, somewhere in the journey of your life to greatness, there will be temporal disruption. But when those moments come, you must be confident in yourself and in your God and tell yourself that this is where I belong. And so nothing will shake me. I'm not talking to somebody. That's why you don't say you are poor, but you just have to say, I am going through a transition. That is why you don't say, I am sick to death, but I'm just going through a phase because I understand that my poverty today is a temporary disruption. I am blessed too much to be cursed. And so even though I don't have money in my pocket, doesn't mean that I am poor. So even though things are not going right for you, doesn't mean that you are not blessed. It's a temporary disruption. It's momentary. And so when those moments come, you must be confident in your God and say, let the weak say what? I am strong. And let the poor say, I am rich. When the devil comes against you, speak to yourself. Don't give up because some part of your life is falling apart. That's not the end of your life. And let me like this is not the end of your life. I am going somewhere, so follow me, please. This is not a limit. So some of you, when you live here, you are going through some difficult moment. You must go and look at yourself in the mirror and tell yourself, strength is who I am. Favor is who I am. Even though the doctor says you are sick, you tell yourself, strength is who I am. Even though your environment suggests that you are poor, you tell yourself, rich is who I am. I am not down, I am up. I am I'm a head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. And I am not moved by what I see. I am not moved by what I hear. I am moved by what God says. There will be moments where there will be disruptions in your life. How do you handle those moments? Those are the times we throw tantrums. Elijah was being pursued by Jezebel. He ran and ran and then he laid under some tree and said, God, kill me. Kill me, I'm tired. I'm not the only prophet, kill me. And then he slept and God came and slapped me and said, eat some food. And then he ate some more and went to bed. God slapped me again and said, get up and eat for the journey ahead of you is far. Excuse me, God. I am talking about Jezebel. And God did not address Jezebel. God did not talk about that issue. And so God is saying that what is interrupting your life is not my issue. I am bigger than what is interrupting your life. And so many a times we spend time talking about Jezebel. And God is saying the journey ahead is far. You need to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Somebody endure to the end. I'm not talking to somebody here. Fear none of distance with that shall suffer. Behold, the devil will cast some of you into prison and some of you will be tested for 10 days. But be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Hear me? Temporal disruption of your life does not mean that God is not with you. Even when you make a mistake and it's evident and everybody's lashing at you, that is not the end of your life. Have confidence in yourself. Oh, my Bibles and my enemies, do not laugh at me because when I fall, I shall rise again. And when I sit in darkness, Jehovah shall be my light. Let them laugh at you. Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Somebody say yes. Sometimes we make some mistakes and they become evident and everybody becomes aware of it and they use that against us. And they make you feel like you are nothing. Temporal disruption. A man with a vision, all of a sudden your vision seems to be dead. And all they know about you is their negativity. You lost your job, you lost your marriage, everything's going downhill. And sometimes we ask ourselves, God, why me? Why have thou forsaken me? Temporal disruption. But in those moments, you need to seek your inner man and see God. For Micah says, even when I fall seven times, I shall rise again. And so my enemies, sometimes you need to look at the face of your enemies in the midst of your poverty, in the midst of your disgrace, in the midst of your embarrassment and look at them and tell them, I have fallen, but watch out for me because I am coming back. 
Oh, that is why I love the spirit of Anos was nigger. It doesn't matter what you do to that man. He will fall down and he will get up and tell you, I will be back. I came to tell somebody, you will be back. I came to tell somebody, you will be back. Your glory will be back. Your favor will be. Your money will be. Your riches will be. Your confidence will be. In fact, it is coming back. It is coming back. It is coming back. It is coming. It is coming. Your glow is coming. It is not over with you. I see heaven open. If you believe I'm talking to you, lift up your two hands and give the Lord a shout. Who told you this is the end of my life? It's a temporary disruption. I am going through a phase. Ah, for the race is not to the swift. <laughs> not the battle to the strong bread it's not for wise men favor it's not for skillful men it is time and chance that has happened to all of them when you put time and chance together it's equal to opportunity i came to tell somebody you fell but after this abandoned conference get ready for a new opportunity remember ye not the former things neither consider the things of old i hear god say i will do a new thing and it shall be permanent ah god will do a new thing for you all of a sudden your business is crashed in your face and everything you have worked for is going down the drain and you know problem comes in sequences right you lost your job and your children are about to be fired from school as well and your car breaks down as well and then when things begin to get tough then the sister begin to change his dialect, her dialect. and then all of a sudden everything seems to be crumbling down and you want to ask God where are you the place of bread is experiencing famine God did not guarantee that there would not be problems was it not God with the people of, with the disciples crossing over to the other side? God said, let us cross, Jesus said, let us cross over to the other side. He said, let's go to the other side and do ministry on the other side. We have sat here for far too long. We have healed the sick. We have fed them. They are okay. Let's go to the other side. He got into the boat. He began to sleep and storm arose. Jesus was with them and there was a storm. Temporal disruption. The father Jesus is with you doesn't mean that life will not be hard. Let's stop indoctrinating Christians and telling them Christianity is problem free. No, no, no. The other day, I thought about this thing. Jesus did ministry for three years and he ran to heaven. And I asked myself, Prince, why are, you do, why are you doing this for life? Even Jesus, he did it for three years after Judas betrayed him. After he, Thomas... The, uh, Peter denied him after he was crucified he said me and he, was, he, he managed to get up from, from dead he said I am done and he left but you and I we want to do it for life grace I said grace but thank God for the spirit of God he gave us the spirit of Christ and it dwells in us and it shall quicken our mortal bodies and yet with that there will be temporary disruption things will go wrong sometimes and so Elimelech takes his wife, Naomi, and they left to Moab. Now let me give you a little background of Moab. Moab is a place of disorder. In the book of Genesis chapter 19, Mr. Lot was there. Abraham was a man of order. And God called him. And, God, and when God called him, Abraham called his his. his nephew to come with him and at some point God was blessing them until Lot has men began to fight with Abraham's men at that point Lot has become so confident of himself that he didn't have respect he and his men did not have respect for Abraham and his men and so his has men fought Abraham's men he did not acknowledge the apostolic mandate that was upon Abraham's life the one whom God called, the one whom through his become blessed. And so, Lord, Abraham calls Lot and says, you know what? There's no need for us to fight. So you choose one place. And when you are done, me and my people can also go to the, the other side. 
And if Lot was smart and if it was a man of order, he should have told Abraham that you are the one God called. You are the one with the mantle. You are the leader and I'm the follower. And so you choose and give the rest to me or you appoint to me something. But because that man did not respect um, the apostolic mandate upon, upon Abraham and because he was a man of absolute disorder and total anarchy, he had the audacity to choose. But what he did not realize is that it was not the place, it was the man. Put a man who is blessed in a prison and he will turn the place around. Put a blessed man in a place where there was dryness and by the mantle and the mandate of God upon his life. Look at you, look at the things you have survived. It's because you carry mandate. The same thing that happened to somebody and died, it happened to you, but you are still here. Because it is not about the place, it's about you. There was a spirit of God upon your life. There was wisdom upon you. The same thing that happened to somebody and killed the person, it happened to you, but you, blessed be the name of the Lord. It gave you a testimony because he that is born of the spirit is like a wind uh, and no man knoweth where the wind cometh from and no man knoweth where the wind goeth. You are born of the spirit and Bible says you are like the wind the devil will try to stop the wind but the wind cannot be stopped let the devil do everything he wants to do but you will not be stopped because you are born of the spirit and you are like the wind the same thing that happened to a brother and he ran away from the church it happened to you but Sunday after Sunday you come to the presence of God you lift up your handkerchief and you praise God because you are born of the spirit and you are like the wind the same thing that happened to the sister and she ran away from the choir it happened to you you come for rehearsals you sing with them every day even though they are talking about you you don't give them any attention because you are born of the spirit receive the power to overcome I said receive the anointing to overcome you did not hear me I said receive grace to overcome by my God, I shall run through troops. By him, I will leap over walls. When you leave here, you will leap over walls. When you leave here, you will run through troops. Nothing can stop you. Nothing can stop you. Nothing can limit you. For nay, 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 nay. In all of this things, we are more than conquerors. Give him some praise in the house. Who told you you can simply stop me? Who told you you can easily stop me? Who told you? Who told you, man? Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. My iPad went down. Figure it out. Somebody help me. I cannot preach. I cannot preach. Now hear me. Look at me. And so, Bible said, Elimelech, takes his wife and they went to Moab. Now, when Abraham and Lot's men fought and they were separated, Lot and his wife and his children, I beg your pardon, they went to live in a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? And we all know that Sodom and Gomorrah is a place of what? Disorder. A place of absolute anarchy. A place of total nonsense. No wonder that lost children, be with me. No wonder lost children could not produce children. The daughters could not give her because when you live in a place of disorder, you cannot produce. Disorder does not produce anything. And so they lived there for years, but there was no babies coming out. And so finally God comes and said, you know what? I'm about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And then the same Abraham pleaded for the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Pleaded for Lot and his family. And yet they left. And Sodom and Gomorrah was totally destroyed. God destroys this order. Are you hearing me? And then, Lot's wife still looked back. She became what she became. And then Lot and his two, and his two daughters continued. They went to live in the cage called Zeus. In that cage... Lord's daughters have sexual relationship with their own father. What an abomination. What a disorder. 
The first child that came out of that baby was called Moab. So that's how the Moabites came about. And Elimelech leaves the place of bread, the place of order, and takes his wife and his two sons to the place of this order. What a mistake. Are you following me? What a, what a terrible mistake. And so, whilst he was there in the place of this order, his Elimelech dies. This order kills, ladies and gentlemen. To not begin to examine certain things. This order kills. Elimelech dies. His two sons, Malion and Chilion, also dies after 10 years. You can't move from order to disorder because there was a temporal interruption of your life. Stay focused. Be strong. Be authentic. Believe in who you are. When life rises hard against you, be strong and face life. And stop throwing tantrums like a baby. I'm not talking to somebody here. And let me like, what have you done? He made such a terrible mistake. Oh my goodness. And then after 10 years, Naomi says, I cannot handle this anymore. I need to go back. I can't stay here. I've lost a husband. I have lost my two sons. I have no hope again. When you live in the place of this other, vision is killed, purposes are destroyed, businesses are aborted, greatness, greatness is diminished. But tonight, somebody is going to move from this order back to order. You see, I, I, whether you said amen or not, it is something God said and God will do. Because for many of us sitting down here, we carry so much greatness. But the anchor of this order is holding us some way, somehow. And because of that, we cannot migrate to the place we're supposed to be. But tonight, I hear God saying, let the chains be broken. And for some of us, it's going to be mental brokenness. We have to take some lead off from our minds. Some of us, we have to break some emotional tides. Some of us, we have to deal with some mental issues. We have to come out of this disorder. You know you are great. You feel it. You know there's more you can do. But some way, somehow, you can't go forward. You try it and then and there's a resistance. And, and, and you feel that something is resisting you. And, 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 and sometimes all you need is to go back. Tonight, if I hear like that, it's not by might and it's not by power, but my spirit says the Lord, anything that holds you cannot hold you anymore. Since the day of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffered violence and the violence are taken by force. You are coming out of this order tonight. You are coming out of poverty tonight. You are coming out of sickness tonight. No more failure, no more disease, no more confusion, no more disappointment for you to free you shall be free indeed tonight freedom is coming you are coming are coming out you are coming out you are coming out of anything that oppresses you anything that suppresses you you are coming out of it if you believe it shout yes and shout i am coming out we see grace to come out have you been in that state where you look at yourself and you tell yourself, this is not me. There's more to me. And yet you can't figure out what is wrong. Do not let that thing be broken. Put your two hands on your head and say, the me in me is coming out. I said it is coming out. It is coming out. It is coming out. I see there was a glory. I see there was a lifting. Oh, many there be that say that there's no help in him for me. But thou, O oh Lord, you are the shield around me. You are my glory. And the lifter up of my head. Tonight, may God lift your head up. May God lift you from Mali clay and set your feet upon a rock. Tonight, uh, the curses of your fathers cannot hold any longer. Tonight, uh, what destroyed you cannot destroy you any longer. Tonight, you are moving forward. You are going forward. Oh, Moses, go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. There is a time to go. Tonight is the time. You are going back. You are running back. You are galloping back. You refuse to stay where you are. Somebody say, I am running back. And if you believe I'm talking to you, lift up your two hands and shout, yes. 
It's okay. Can I preach? Can I, can, I, can I finish this? Can I finish this? And so Naomi was like, I want to go back to Bethlehem. I cannot live in this order. I'm sick and tired of living in this. Men, let's be careful the decisions we make. Forget about that thing. Let's be careful the decisions we make for our families. Okay? We must be careful because, I mean, there are lives and destinies that God has entrusted into our hands. And so when we are, we are making decisions, we should not just be thinking about today. One of the people I can't stand are the people who live in the moment. They, they get so caught up in the moment until they forget about everything. I'll talk about that tomorrow. When they are happy in the moment, they don't think anymore. When they are sad in the moment, they don't think anymore. No. You can't just live in the moment. When the moment comes, connect it to the past and think about the future before you make decisions. Oh, this is me. me. I can't handle it. You are just living in the moment. When you are happy, you are happy. Ah, you don't think. And so Naomi comes up and says, No, this not ought to be so. Burying children is not ought to be so. I buried my husband. It is not ought to be so. I am in poverty. It doesn't have to be like that. I come from the place of wealth. I need to go back. Tonight, I don't care where you have been, but we are going back. <laughs> Somebody, after this program, one month after today, somebody will look at you and ask you what happened to you. You will tell them, I went back. I am back. I am back. I am back because the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former. When you come back, great things will happen to you. If you believe it, shall yes. And so, and so Naomi said, I'm going back. And, and, and Ruth and Opa comes. And, 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 and I said, we are going with you. And Naomi said, no, 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 no. Look at me. I'm old. I don't have any energy to give birth to children. Even if I do, you guys cannot wait. So why don't you just go back to your people? Go find some life. Find some men. Let them rub their hands on your head and enjoy life, okay? And Opa looked at, the, looked at Naomi and said, you just spoke sense. And so she bought into that sense. And then she, 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 she gave a kiss and, 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 and then she left back, sad. And she left back. There's a thin line between the people I call the kisses and the cleavers. A thin line. Isn't it the kiss that betrayed Jesus? We are not looking for kisses. We are looking for cleavers. People who will cleave and cling on to us. But Ruth said, you want me to go back? Ruth looked at Naomi and said, you want me to go back because you don't have husband or children for me? Do you know where I'm coming from? I was born in the place of disorder. I grew up with disorder. I have tasted disorder. I lived in disorder. My upbringing is the one of disorder until you came into my life. Even though you were living in disorder with me, when you talked, I see God. When you spoke, I saw God in you. The way you handled life, it made me realize that there's order in your spirit. Because when it is planted in your spirit, it cannot die. And so Ruth said to Naomi, I see God with you. You are a woman of order. You are a woman of class, a woman of decency. My people can never be compared with you. And so stop telling me to go back to this order. And so she said to New Ruth, Ruth said to Naomi, entreat me not to leave thee, not to return from going, following after thee. She said, where thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodges, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God shall be my God. Where thou diest, there will I die. And there will I also be buried. Because you have a God of order. You have a life of order. I am not going to let order go. I will hold on to order. I will run away from this order. Until my life can also become the life of what? Order. And so... Ruth refused to go back to this order. Tonight, you must refuse. You must refuse. You must make a conscious decision. You must make a deliberate attempt 
This is not anything spiritual scope. You don't need anybody to use spiritualism or spirituality. No, this calls for mental decision. This calls for conscious effort. And say, I have had enough of this kind of life. And so now, I have tasted order. So I want to go to the place of order. Am I talking to somebody here? Listen, we live in the country of disorder. We come from homes and villages and cities where there are absolute disorder. You can't tell me you don't know what I'm talking about. There are things that are holding on to you. There are things that are pulling you back. There are things that are messing you. You are trying your best, but things are pulling you back. You are pushing forward, but they won't just let you be. Tonight, not lie. Tonight, it no go be. Tonight, it is over. Tonight, it is over in this atmosphere. If you are like me, we are saying goodbye to Moab. We are on our way back to Bethlehem. Are you coming with me? Let's go. Sayas. Give somebody a high five and tell the person, I am going to the other side. And so, Ruth follows Naomi. Yeah. And, and they got to Bethlehem. And Naomi said, now I'm here. And Ruth said, me too, I'm here. We have come to the place of order. Back to order. And then Naomi began to talk to Ruth and say, you know what? Yeah, just go to the field and go and glean. Eh? And then while she was gleaning, Kebosha, Lord help me. While she was gleaning, he gave me some skills. And then you, you, you will see people there, but you will also see a man there. But just go and glean, eh? And glean sincerely, eh? Glean faithfully, eh? Because you will not know where the man will be watching from, eh? So do it the best way you know to do it, eh? When you expect him to be looking at you from this way, he may not be looking at you from this way. And so be careful how you conduct yourself, eh? Some of us, we have in our minds how they are looking at us and where they are looking at us from. So we try so hard to impress them. But sometimes you don't know where they'll be looking at from. You don't know which angle they are coming from. And so you need to be all-rounded. You need to be perfect. You need to be accurate in your dealings. Am I talking to somebody? And so, hey! hey. And so he she told her, he said, go and do Go and do it, but be careful. Do it diligently. And Ruth, obviously, is a woman of diligence. A woman of virtue power. She knows what she wants. And so she gets into the field and she begins to glean. And she's gleaning, doing it with style, with charisma, with anointing. Don't forget she has tasted order and she knows this order so she can draw the line. And so she has totally subtracted herself from this order. Her dressing was perfect, her mannerisms were okay, her walking was all right, even the way she bows down was okay. Even the way she picks from the field was all right. And Boaz was looking, and bear in mind, there were other ladies on the field glaring. And so how come, how come, how come of all the other ladies who were there, and they were still glaring, how come Boaz did not find any of them but Ruth? Mm -mm, because there is something in Ruth. There is something in Ruth. Other has located Ruth. And Ruth is doing it diligently. My God, our... <laughs> And, 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 and Boaz, Boaz was like, I cannot handle this woman, I cannot handle, I got to marry her. And, 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 and she picks Boaz, and she picks Ruth, and then and takes Ruth to the altar, and said, of all the women here, you are unique, you are outstanding, you are powerful, you are gracious, you are audacious, you are amazing, you are wonderful, you are fantabulous, you are something. May you become something. I am, I am going somewhere, I am I'm going somewhere, I am I'm getting there. And then, and then, and then. She, she, he, Boaz marries Ruth. Ah, order has met order in the place of order. Order has met order in the place of order. So there is productivity. And so out of Boaz and Ruth comes who? Obed. They give birth to Obed. Obed gave birth to Jesse. Right? Jesse gave birth to David. Out of the lineage of David comes Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, my savior, my redeemer, our counselor, our soon and coming king, our reigning Lord. Jesus comes from the lineage of Ruth, 
who was born and raised in Boaz but until she decided that I will no longer stay in Boaz Boaz Moab until she decided that I will no longer stay in Moab every greatness in her never emerged but the moment she migrated from Moab and found herself in a place of order Jesus came out of her my God Ruth is the career of the Messiah in spite of her background in spite of everything she had to go through she was able to prove produce our savior through her Jesus came do you know why because even though she was in Moab she carried something in her but your greatness can never come out and you can never be productive so long as you remain in this order and so once he moved from this order and came to the place of order the greatness began to come out as I begin to close, hear me. For some of us, we are wondering, when, how, when can I, how can I even make it? And you are counting your days and your years. And you look at your life and you are like, no, it's getting too late. I have a news for you. You may be like Ruth. All you need to do is to check your background. All you need to do to come from to, to this to divorce your, yourself from this order and, and, and disconnect from certain things and migrate to the place of order. When you find order, greatness will come out of you. Am I talking to somebody here? If Ruth was able to produce Jesus, I came to announce to you that there's something in you. It doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter what you are going through. I see greatness in you, and tonight it's going to come out. Tonight is coming out. Am I talking to somebody? Am I blessing somebody? Somebody, are you getting what I'm saying? Look at somebody and tell the person, look at me. Look at me very well. Watch out for me. You think you know me. You don't know nothing about me. Get ready, get ready, get ready. One of these days, you will see me. And you will not realize. And you will not recognize me. Because what is in me is about to come out. Say, watch out for me because I am coming out. I am coming, I'm coming, I'm coming out. I am coming, I am coming out. I am coming out, 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 I am coming out. I'm not talking to you. I am coming out, I am coming out. I am coming out, I am coming out. If you believe I'm talking to you, rise up to your feet, lift up your two hands, and shout, Yes. And shout, I am coming out. Sit, sit down. Sit down. Let me finish this. Let me finish this. Let me finish this. And then, the scripture we read from Matthew. Okay. We, we read about the woman. Give me that Matthew scripture, please. Matthew chapter, let me close with this. Matthew chapter 1. Oh. And then, Go to verse 2. Go to verse 3. Go to verse 4. Uh, and Nashon begat Salom. Somebody say Salom. And go to verse 5. And Salom begat Boaz. Of who? Rehab. How many of you know Rehab? Oh, come talk to me. How many of you know Rehab? Rehab there. Is Rehab there. You see, we still call her the harlot. That's human beings for you. A woman bled for 12 years. She, she was healed, but we still call her the woman with the issue. If you allow people, they will label you forever. Refuse to be labeled. <laughs> A woman is healed, cleansed. Christians, pastor, we still call her the woman with the issue of blood. Why now? Can't we pardon people and let their past belong to their past and accept them where they are and expect their future to be better? Okay, so Simon 
meet Rahab, the prostitute. Try looking for a job. And on your CV, you write, I've been a prostitute for seven years. And see who will employ you. Rahab the harlot. I'm closing. And then this man, Salmon, I don't know the grace he carries. The anointing Salmon carries. Salmon meets Rahab and she looks at the prostitute closely. And she, he said, when I look at you, I don't just see a prostitute. I see you living in this order. But I'm going to help you. And so someone marries Rahab. Pulls Rahab out of this order. Brings Rahab to a place of order. And so out of Simon and Rahab, they give birth to Boaz. Out of Boaz and Ruth comes who? Obed. And then out of Obed comes Jesse. And out of Jesse comes David. And out of David comes Jesus. And so you are telling me the great, great, great grandmother of Jesus was a prostitute. Papa, what would you think about Rahab? We have given up on her and written her off. But I thank God for Simon. He said, when I see you, when I look at you, I don't see a prostitute. I see in you the lineage of the Messiah. And so I'm not going to condemn you, but I'm going to hold your hands and give me your hands, Papa. I'm going to hold your hands and help you and pull you out. Tonight, may God pull somebody out. I'm not talking to somebody here. And he pulls her out because he, he knew that Rahab carried something. That is to say that it doesn't matter who you think you are. It doesn't matter what you think you have done. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter the amount of disorder and the level and the magnitude of disorder that you have lived in. Tonight, there is grace to pull us from disorder. Maybe you have tried and tried and failed, but tonight it will work. Are you ready to pray? If Rahab can be the great grandmother of Jesus, then who are you to give up on yourself? In this place, I see an, an atmosphere. There's an anointing pulling people from darkness. What held you cannot hold you anymore. What says no cannot stop you anymore. The limit that was placed on you tonight is being broken. The barrier on you is breaking right now. I see people running. For upon Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance. And there shall be holiness. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possession. Tonight, I see you coming out. Out of disorder. Out of poverty. Out of sickness. Out of shame. Somebody, lift up your voice and begin to pray. We are going to shake the devil off. We are going to shake that thing off. It is time for you to step out. It is time for you to step out. Somebody lift up your voice and let's begin to pray. 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 Tonight, I want you to be serious. Something must break. Something must lose. 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 Something must let go. Thank you for listening to the message. Visit us on www.harvestinternationalministries.org. Send us an email through office at harvestinternationalministries.org or call us on 0302-222-372. 
or 0302-229-109. God bless you.